This is a review for the 1972 British horror film Deathline, directed by Gary Sherman and starring Donald Pleasance. You may remember Sherman from Poltergeist 3, which he would direct a good 15 to 20 years after this film. I don't recognise any of his other credits, not that there's been that many of them. Now, I'd say this is probably one of my more obscure reviews. I came to it for two reasons. Firstly, Pleasance is in the title role. I absolutely love that guy, not just because of Halloween. He's done so many other cool roles. And secondly, I don't know if it counts as its own subgenre, but I absolutely love horror films which take place in underground train tunnels. So other films I could name off the top of my head, Creep, another British film from 2004. Then there's an American film, Stag Night, which took place under the New York subway system. And if we speak about some more famous films like Cloverfield, for example, one of my favourite scenes from that film took place in the underground train system. And Ghostbusters 2, again, abandoned underground train tunnels. There's just something about me and train tunnels when it comes to horror. Even films which take place on trains above the ground, I like those too. So if you know any other films that fall into those categories, by all means, name some in the comments. I would love to check them out. Now, the story for this takes place in and around the London underground tube system. There are a group of cannibals living in an abandoned section of the line, quite close to an active train station. And what they've been doing for quite some time prior to the beginning of this film is abducting commuters and taking them back to their lair and eating them. But one day they accidentally go after the wrong person, a politician with sufficient enough standing that his disappearance will not go unnoticed. And so Detective Calhoun, played by Pleasance, decides to get his thinking cap on and investigate. So we have Donald Pleasance investigating cannibals in abandoned underground train tunnels. Basically sounded absolutely amazing to me. So I went and bought the Blu-ray without even seeing the film. Here it is. It's not got that many features on it, although I didn't expect it to. It does, though, have an extremely cool booklet inside which talks with great reverence about the movie and another thing I like about this release is the fact that the box is so bloody thin I mean if every blu-ray I had had a box this thin it would probably double my capacity there will be spoilers today but this film is not full of twists or great reveals it is more about the journey though proceed at your own peril now let me just say this is a very realistically portrayed film it's not full of the usual movie excesses that are often just thrown in there to please the Saturday night crowd. It is a bit of a slow burn. It's as if the writer set out to make something which could just as easily be a retelling of real world events. Calhoun spends way more time above the ground than he does under it. There is a police procedural aspect to this film, which some people might find a little slow. If you're expecting a story where Calhoun goes down into the tunnels after about 15 minutes and then he's running around with a club bashing cannibals like it's the descent no it's not like that at all also the cannibals in this film are not your usual soulless nasty monsters like you might see in say wrong turn we spend quite a bit of time seeing the world through their point of view actually it's established in the story that they've been surviving in these tunnels for a hundred years or more and they've kept having babies with each other but at the start of this story for through whatever circumstance, they're down to just two of them left, and one of them is dying. And that person actually does die 20 minutes in, so it gets down to just one guy. And you can see the pain and grief on his face at this development and how scared he is to suddenly be in this dark environment all by himself. He never expected this, and he doesn't know what to do, in all honesty. So we, we do feel a little bit of sympathy for this guy as he sort of blusters his way around, carrying on killing people. And it's not like he can just go back up and reintegrate himself in society. He's never learned to speak English. I think they've always communicated with grunts, these people. The only words this guy knows are mind the doors, which presumably he's heard through the ceiling being said by the intercom in, in the nearby train station. At one point, he tries to, to say these words to a woman he's abducted, and it, it's quite sad actually watching him say this, hoping that he's going to get some coherent understanding from the woman, and, and he doesn't. Now, we're not talking Beauty and the Beast type sadness. I wasn't sat there at the end of this film with a hanky like, oh, the poor cannibal. You know, it, uh, when we get to the final confrontation, we're still very much rooting for the, the good guys, if you like. But certainly there was a lot more depth to this villain than you would normally see in any kind of cannibal film. There are a couple of extremely interestingly directed scenes. So firstly, our introduction to the cannibal's lair comes in the form of this ridiculously slow panning shot the camera literally moves at a snail's pace as it 
gradually reveals little details to us of a limb on a table or a body hanging on a wall, a dripping tap, etc, etc. It possibly goes on for too long. Eventually the camera goes into another section of the underground entirely and comes to rest on this tunnel mouth that's filled with bricks and debris, presumably the exact spot where the original cave-in happened that trapped the descendants of the cannibal. And what we get here is a little audio track of the cries and shouts of the men as they realised the tunnel was coming down around them. I found this the most chilling moment in the movie, actually. And it was much better done this way than if we'd actually seen a visual flashback that could possibly have looked a little cheap and nasty. Another scene which I would say is more bizarre than clever in terms of the way it was filmed comes about 10 minutes from the end. We see Calhoun and a few police colleagues of his at the back of this tunnel, about 150 yards away, roughly. And in the foreground are some other characters, and, and Calhoun and co are slowly walking towards the foreground. I'm thinking to myself, we're not just going to watch these guys walk all this way with nothing happening, are we? Well, we do. And then Calhoun gets to these people at the front and says, like, one line of dialogue, maybe two tops, I, I can't remember. Now, normally when you shoot a scene like this, you, you might have Calhoun walking the last 10 yards of that trip and then the dialogue. But for some reason, Gary Sherman in the editing room thought to himself, I'll just leave in that entire walk. Let's have Donald Pleasant just walking all this way for no reason. Now, I wouldn't want to see something like this in every film. I'd end up just being sat there with the remote, fast forwarding loads of scenes. But as a one off thing, I, I thought it was quite cool, even though it was a little pointless. Speaking of Pleasance, this is possibly my favourite ever performance that he's done. As cool as he is as Blofeld and as iconic as he is as Dr Loomis in that famous Mac, I don't think I've ever seen him play a character that's required as much acting skill as this one. Granted, I don't think I've ever seen Donald Pleasance in a lead role before, there is that. But Calhoun is so funny and he's got this trait of completely changing his facial expression at random moments halfway through a scene. So he'll be talking something serious about the case and then next minute he'll suddenly come alive and crack some funny the sort of which you'd normally see from an uncle at a wedding and then he'll go back to being serious again now you might think that speaks to an inconsistent tone but it just feels like a real guy in a real workplace who's confident enough in his abilities that he can do his job and crack a few funnies and offend a few people at the same time and Pleasance plays it brilliant granted it does feel a little bit cliched at time the design of this character I mean you could say and it would be true that he's an uncompromising cop, but he's got a bad home life. Both traits are working hand in hand. At one point, Calhoun answers the phone at home and we can see in that scene that he has no wife. Now, his relationship status is not mentioned at any other point in the movie. So possibly that's been deliberately written that way just to give us a little nugget of information that he is alone. And I could be wrong about this, but I'm sure that he answers the phone in a single bed as well and not a double one. So... Maybe that tell us, tells us as well that not only is he alone, but he's also been that way for quite some time and he's not expecting to meet anybody in the future. So there's a sadness behind this character that we don't get to fully explore beyond the surface. But at work, he's not lost his moral compass. He, he treats his position of responsibility very seriously under all the humour. He could have given up on this case at several intervals either through a lack of leads or because certain characters try and dissuade him from going down a certain rabbit hole, but he carries on anyway. And yet, at one point, about half an hour from the end, he goes on a random piss-up with his colleague. I mean, he's literally dancing around the pinball machine with a glass of sherry, like, oh, I'm thinking to myself, Donald, what are you doing? There's like 30 minutes of the runtime left. We've got cannibals to catch. But that is just this film to a T. It, it does its own thing and it will get to its destination in its own time and in its own completely bizarre way and yet it feels like this might happen this way in real life. Some of the rest of the cast are worth mentioning for various reasons. Sharon Gurney as Patricia is excellent. She's a local London girl with a heart of gold. She absolutely cannot let it lie that she's seen this guy go missing at the beginning of the film. She doesn't care whether it's a beggar or a politician. She cannot move on with her life without finding out what happened to him. She doesn't have a Wikipedia page, Sharon Gurney, so I don't know if her acting career didn't quite last the pace I haven't really dug into it but if it didn't it's a shame she's good I've heard it said in a few reviews that David Ladd's performance as Patricia's American boyfriend is a little bit uneven I don't think it's the quality of the acting necessarily just the fact that an American wasn't really needed for this film you you honestly don't see that many Americans wandering around English cities 
I think it would have been a bit more realistic if this character had been maybe an, an Englishman, but from the north of England, then you could have still had that fish out of water feel. I would make this exact same point if it was an English actor unnecessarily in an American production. And Lord knows that has happened countless times. I cannot let this review slide, by the way, without mentioning the fact that Christopher Lee is in it. Why have you not mentioned that until now? Because he's only in one scene. It's a good scene, though. He has this big argument with Donald Pleasance's Calhoun. It's such a joy watching these two great actors on screen together. I'm surprised Lee agreed to do this film, given the fact that he's only got one scene. He was very famous already by 1973. Marlon Brando was almost in this. He actually agreed to play the cannibal, but his son fell ill at the last minute, so he had to be replaced by the lesser-known Hugh Armstrong. Luckily, Armstrong is absolutely brilliant as the cannibal, and who knows, maybe Brando wouldn't have done it as well. To get to my final summary then, I would definitely recommend you at least watch this film once, if only for Donald Pleasance's performance. In terms of buying it, I would maybe stay away from that. I'm not sure the rewatchability factor is high enough, given the fact that it's such a slow burn. And if I'm completely honest, I didn't get my full satisfaction from this until afterwards when I'd fully reflected on all the clever things and the way it was directed and certain performances. Excitement throughout is maybe not as high as some similar films, but it's certainly interesting now and again checking out a British film that's half drama like this is and has such a fascinating performance by a guy like Donald Pleasance in it. I'm glad I checked it out. I'm glad I watched it and I'm glad I've done a review for it. So let's get to the Bag of Terror and find out what score I've decided to go with. I've not done a negative section today. That doesn't mean we're heading for a brilliant score. It just means I didn't really have anything to say other than the fact that there is part of me that would have liked to have seen a more Hollywoodized version of Deathline afterwards. I'd almost like two versions of this movie, the one that we get and the one that we could maybe daydream about getting. But if I had to choose, I would keep this one. So, that score. One, two, three. Three and a half bloody axes for Deathline. Right, I'll be back for another review next time. For now, goodbye.